The following program is brought to you by Stetson University College of Law, the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law, and was funded by the U.S. Department of Justice's Bureau of Justice Assistance's Capital Case Litigation Initiative. Forensic Science Essentials, Challenges in Fire Analysis and Document Examination, the fifth in our series of webinars for the Bureau of Justice Assistance. I'm your guest host, Eileen Finan, and I am the Director of Technology and Distance Education for the National Clearinghouse for Science, Technology, and the Law. This webinar is produced by the National Clearinghouse and the Office of Professional Education at Stetson University College of Law. Today's webinar will explore the investigative challenges and legal implications related to scientific fire analysis and forensic document examination. Our experts will discuss investigative techniques, current research, training, and standards for each discipline. The webinar will also address the credentials defense attorneys and prosecutors should look for when dealing with an expert witness in these disciplines. Our panelists will offer tips and takeaway points for effective presentation of scientific evidence and useful cross and direct examination strategies. Joining me today on the panel are Dr. Linton Mohammed and Mr. John Lentini. Dr. Linton Mohammed has been in the field of forensic document examination for over 30 years. He's testified uh, as an expert witness more than 100 times in the United States, England, and the Caribbean. He's a co-author of The Neuroscience of Handwriting, Applications for Forensic Document Examination, and has published several papers in peer-reviewed journals. He is a certified by the American Board of Document Examiners, Inc., and holds a diploma in document examination from the Chartered Society of Forensic Scientists. Sciences. He is a member and past president of the American Society of Question Document Examiners, Inc., and is currently serving as the chair of Question Document Section of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. He serves on the editorial review boards of the Journal of Forensic Sciences and the Journal of the American Society of Question Documents, and is a guest reviewer for several other journals. Dr. Mohammed is an appointed member of the expert working group in human factors in forensic document examination, sponsored by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. He also has served two years as an appointed member of Physics and Pattern Evidence Scientific Area Committee of the Organization of Scientific Area Committees, OSAC, sponsored by NIST. And Mr. John Lentini is one of a handful of people certified to conduct both crime scene invest fire crime scene investigations and fire debris analysis. He has personally conducted more than 2,000 fire scene inspections and has appeared as an expert witness on more than 200 occasions. He is an active proponent of the standards for fire and other forensic investigations. He's a member of NFPA Technical Committee on Fire Investigations, 921, and Technical Committee on Fire Investigator Professional Qualifications, 1033. And he has served three times as the chair of ASTM Committee E30 on Forensic Science. John is the past president, pa excuse me, he's the past chairman of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, Criminalistic Section. He also serves on NIST OSAC Subcommittee on Fire and Explosion Investigations. He received the Society of Fire Protection Engineers 2015 Person of the Year Award in recognition of his work in moving the fire investigation profession forward and in helping to prevent or reverse miscarriages of justice in arson cases. He is the author of Scientific Protocols for Fire Investigation, now in its second edition, published by CRC Press. 
We'll now talk about some general information for the webinar uh, prior to starting the content. While the webinar is in progress, you can chat with us at any time. Use the chat feature found on the right-hand side of your login screen. We will answer as many of your questions as possible. Please note that we may not be able to get to all of your questions while on the air. However, we will answer all the questions that you send us in it and send out a separate QA document via email. This webinar is designed for both prosecutors and defense attorneys. Attendees who complete the webinar will be eligible for continuing legal education credits. The Stetson Office of Professional Education will work with each individual participant for reporting specifics. CLC applications will be made to Florida and other states per individual request. Please email OPE at law.stetson.edu for further information and state specific requests. I'd like to start off the webinar by showing a video of fire flashover. This chair is stuffed with plastic foam. It has the fuel potential of 50,000 candles and no mechanism to control the release. The steady heat of a cigarette accidentally dropped between the cushions can create a disaster. Initially, the burning cigarette creates a smoldering fire, which breaks down the foam stuffing into vaporous fuel. When there's enough heat and oxygen, it starts to flame. More heat produces more fuel, and the fire accelerates rapidly. Smoke and other products of the fire, including unburnt fuel, collect beneath the ceiling. Within three minutes, the temperature at the ceiling reaches 1,000 degrees, heating the contents of the entire room near the point of ignition. The carpet and other furnishings start to break down into vaporous fuels. Then, within seconds, in a process called flashover, everything in the room erupts into flame. No life survives flashover. After all the oxygen in the room is consumed, a pulsing backdraft sucks in air from the outside, depletes it in a surge of burning, then breathes in more. This took place in less than four minutes and started with a smoldering cigarette. This is a very dramatic video that illustrates not only the intensity and destructive nature of fire, but it also brings into perspective the challenges forensic disciplines face in gathering evidence and presenting that evidence um, within it within the nature and scope of investigations. They're largely complex in nature and have a broad range of investigative techniques associated with them. This webinar will focus on challenges associated with scientific fire analysis and document examination. John, I'd like to begin our program with an overview of fire analysis and what qualifies one to be considered a fire expert. Well, as you saw in that video, it's very, uh complicated what's going on. Uh, Michael Faraday uh, in the 19th century, one of the greatest scientists of that era, uh, spent two very long lectures uh, describing a candle flame. And what goes on in a candle flame uh, is, is very complicated, but what happens in a structure fire is orders of magnitude more complicated. And as a result, uh, people get it wrong sometimes when they go to a fire scene to determine the origin and cause. So, uh, what we're going to cover today is uh, the different types of uh, inaccuracies that people are likely to uh, encounter uh, as lawyers defending cases involving fire. 
Um, what your cases might involve, uh, you know, fire set to cover a murder, that, that, these tend to be pretty obvious uh, when we get the body and mm -hmm. say that there's no smoke. Um, the hard ones are the fires that are resulting in death, uh, but the cause of the fire is going to determine the manner of death. Uh, the cause of death may be uh, smoke inhalation. The manner of death is going to depend on a fire investigator determining what caused the fire. If it's a arson fire, then the manner of death is going to be homicide. If it's an accidental fire, it'll be an accident. Yeah. And the medical examiner, with all of his years of education and training, is relying on a fire investigator who may not have anywhere near that amount of education and training. And it's all over the board. Uh, you have some people that are very qualified, and we have some people that are not. Um, there are four kinds of fires that uh, might be determined. One is natural, uh, lightning, uh, fire caused by a flooded basement, uh, accidental, uh, cooking fires, uh, heating fires, intentional. And those are ones that involve uh, a human setting the fire, putting it where it doesn't belong. And finally, undetermined. Now, all fires are undetermined when they, they start out. And ideally, if you do enough work, you can find the cause of the fire. But it's, it is not uh, very easy. Um, now, the fire experts you might uh, encounter in an uh, arson case um, fall into three categories. You'll have a chemist. Uh, they, they have a uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, they may or may not be certified uh, to do their work. Uh, you may have engineers. Uh, this requires a minimum of a bachelor's degree plus a PE plus a license. Um, and then you have your fire investigators. High school diploma is currently the minimum requirement for education. A uh, fire investigator may or may not be certified, and in most states they are required to have a private investigator license. But the licenses are all over the place. Uh, chemists? Uh, are generally not required to be licensed. Texas will be the first state requiring all forensic scientists to be licensed in 2019. The Texas Forensic Science Commission is putting that together. Uh, engineers, uh, they have to be licensed uh, if they call themselves an engineer. Um, uh, the uh, license exam actually requires passing two uh, very difficult tests. You actually have to demonstrate knowledge. Fire investigators, you have to buy a private investigator's license. Um, licensing is not about knowing what you're doing. It's about paying the state money, filling out a form, and uh, it, it's really about raising money and restraining trade. There is no state that currently licenses fire investigators actually requires them to know anything at all about fires. They've got to know about guns, they've got to know about surveillance, but they don't have to know anything at all about fires. So the qualifications, and we'll go to the, uh, the chemists and engineers, they're going to have an education and training doing what they're doing. Uh, your fire investigators, they may have training, but not any significant education. And without the education, without the basic scientific education, it's very difficult to um, absorb your training and understand what it's about because you just don't, you lack that foundation. But there are a lot of fire investigators you know, who have a high school diploma or maybe an associate's degree, maybe a degree in criminal justice. Uh, it's a very scientific endeavor practiced by non-scientists. Now, we hope that they can be uh, given a scientific mindset, but there are a lot of fire investigators that don't consider themselves scientists. Uh, in, uh, in the chemical analysis of fire debris, you'll find some crime laboratories use drug chemists to analyze fire debris. And they, they may learn it, but um, just being able to operate uh, a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer does not mean that you know how to analyze fire debris. You can identify heroin all day long, but gasoline is a, is a whole other kettle of fish. Fire investigators are required to be qualified per standard called NFPA 1033, which is professional qualifications for fire investigator. And it sets forth the minimum qualifications. 
Uh, this is the book. Um, in 2009, this book changed to require a certain knowledge base, and attorneys have been using this book to challenge the qualifications of fire investigators. It is a standard that applies to everyone in the business. Um, it requires education, high school diploma, but the, it requires knowledge in 16 areas that a lot of fire investigators might not have. It also requires that fire investigators uh, follow the scientific method in all aspects of their investigation. Maybe half of the people doing this work are qualified. And this is why I suggest that you challenge the qualifications of, of anyone who purports to be a fire expert. Uh, it's easier to challenge people on qualifications than on methodology, because fire is so complicated, qualifications not so much. Even if they're certified, and I've seen uh, fire investigators with 30 years of experience and certification behind their names, they can't tell you what a watt is or the basic units of energy or describe the difference between energy and power. So they get training, um, fire investigators, typically from mentors who pass on their belief systems to apprentices. Um, the U.S. Fire Academy and the ATF are now running advanced schools that, that teach the current knowledge. But uh, beware, uh, if the investigator's last school was before 1995, uh, chances are they are schooled in a lot of stuff that isn't true. Uh, the two leading professional organizations, the International Association of Arson Investigators and the National Association of Fire Investigators, they offer both training and certification. Um, the IAAI also offers uh, training that's open and free uh, to anyone who wants to go there. Uh, all that's required is, is a registration. And you can look up any of like 60 different subjects on fire investigation and get free training there. And I, I recommend it to, to everyone. It's set up for the high school graduates so most lawyers can understand it. The certification, uh, the IAAI offers a certified fire investigator, fire investigation technician, and evidence collection technician. Uh, the National Association of Fire Investigators offers a certified fire and explosion investigator, certified vehicle fire investigator, and certified fire investigation instructor. They both require continuing education for recertification. Many investigators are not certified, even though both of these organizations make that available. Uh, they're, they're certified by their boss or by the state or, or by nobody. Uh, there's a, a very large number of people that are not certified by anyone that are going out and rendering origin and cause decisions. The IAAI program is accredited. And what we find is uh, some people with the IAAI certification will claim a second certification. Uh, which is called resume puffing. Um, the NAFI program is uh, not currently accredited. John, I know one of the things that uh, we had talked about is that there are also training challenges in other disciplines, and questions and documents was one of those uh, areas that you talked about with training. So, Linton, People often think of handwriting analysis uh, when they think of question document examination, but forensic document examination is so much more. Um, could you tell us more about the nature of the work performed by a forensic document examiner and the training that's involved? Yes, uh, for, for many years, uh, forensic document examiners were known as the handwriting guys. Uh, typical, or the, you guys just do the, the fraud and forgery types of, um, of cases. But it's much more than that. Um, a forensic document examination uh, encompasses anything that goes into the um, manufacture of a document. Uh, so what is a document? So any material which contains marks, symbols, or signs, either visible, partially visible, or invisible, that may convey a meaning or message. I just want to make one uh, caveat here is that uh, graffiti is something that document examiners normally don't get into, because that's normally not, it's not handwriting, that's more of a drawing. Um, but we, we have been able to solve some graffiti cases successfully when we have comparable specimens. 
The documents can include uh, pencil or ink writings, uh, typewriting. Yes, we still get typewriting cases, uh, as many as before, but it's, it's important for a document examiner to be trained in typewriting, especially when you have uh, maybe like a cold cases that come in that would have typewritten documents. Our printer generating materials, inkjet printing, um, laser printing, the old dot matrix printers, um, you see them every so often. Uh, photocopies, uh, faxes, rubber stamps, uh, postmarks, or other en envelope information, and sometimes even graffiti. So forensic document examiners examine any documents about which a question has been raised considering their authenticity, source, content, or age. As I said, we often call handwriting experts, uh, but the scope of work is far greater. So when to use a document examiner? Of course, handwriting examination. For most um, document examination labs, signatures and handwriting will comprise about 80% of the casework at, at minimum. Uh, there's some specialized labs that for example, like the, the ICE lab, the immigration lab in McLean, and they do lots of passports and visas, things like that, so they may have less handwriting um, examinations to do. Uh, altered documents, uh, erasures, uh, uh, indented writing, tracings, inks, and writing instruments. Now, indented writing is one of the um, types of writings that you can't see with the naked eye, that the document has to be processed in order to erase uh, those indentations. Watermarks and trademarks. A watermark can be used uh, to to date a document. You can say this document was not could not have been prepared before this specific time because this is this was when this actual watermark was made. Uh, check writers we don't see very often. Again, uh, most checks are printed by uh, laser printers or inkjet printers or handwritten. But again, for all cases, uh, they pop up every so often. Uh, char documents. This. Um, comes in, uh, sort of in line with what John does in fire cases. You may have documents that are charred, and we may try to put them back together as much as possible, or try to bring up some of the ink information on those documents to see what was written on them. Uh, rubber stamps, uh, see often. Uh, shredded documents, again, we can put shredded documents uh, back together. Uh, there are actually uh, software programs that, that can help you do that. Uh, photographs, uh, copies, and mechanically printed documents. In the old days, you would have a, um, a four-part pr printing press, and for counterfeit documents, you may get the press and the printing plates, and you can associate those printed documents back to the plates and even the, the press. So indented impressions, um, bank robbery notes, uh, threatening notes, uh, anonymous uh, documents, suicide notes, uh, notepads, paper at crime scenes. So uh, the notepads, paper at crime scenes is, is quite important because quite often investigators uh, miss them. It can be a piece of paper in a garbage bin. I had one case in San Diego uh, a few years ago in which uh, two people were found shot to death in a, in a van in Chula Vista. In the van was a, a notepad. Um, I did the, I processed the document for impressions. Up came the phone number of a hotel room in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Then we had investigators then followed up on that. I found that the, the guy who did the shooting was a drug dealer in Seattle, came to San Diego for a drug dealer went bad and mm -hmm. things. So without doing that, that information would have been lost. So this is just a short video to show how the ESDA works. The ESDA stands for Electrostatic Detection Apparatus and is used to find indented writing. The Electrostatic Detection Apparatus, or ESDA, is an instrument used by forensic document examiners to see indented writing impressions left on a document by someone writing on the pages above that document. We are now going to use the ESDA on a robbery demand note collected as evidence in a bank robbery. Let's see if we can raise any indented writing. This writing is very difficult to see with the naked eye, and we need the ESDA to help make it visible. The ESDA is now turned on, and the document is placed on a steel bed. 
This will create a positive electrostatic charge to the document. A transparent film is pulled over the top of the document. The document and the film together act as an insulator for the electrical charges, creating what is called a capacitor arrangement. A high voltage wand is now passed over the top of the document to create a negative charge. This takes about 20 seconds. The wand charges fiber particles in the indented impressions on the note. We will then use cascading glass beads covered with toner, and the toner particles will adhere to those electrostatically charged paper fibers. Here we can see some indented writing has developed. We can see there's a name, a phone number, and even an address left behind by someone who had written on pages above this note. The ESDA can restore indented writing left behind by writing on up to seven layers of paper above a document. And indented impressions have been known to last as long as 50 years. Now we will make a transparency of the indented writing by using some adhesive film and a white backing sheet. This will make the indented writing we found much easier to read. We now have a good visualization of the indented writing left on the demand note. And more importantly, our investigators have some good leads in the case that they did not have earlier. The best part of all is how the original evidence document is still completely intact. Notice that no chemicals ever came into contact with the document. Nothing has touched the original document except electrical charges. Now that the ESDA work has been completed, the original demand note can go on to be processed for fingerprints. And the transparency containing the recovered indented writing can be submitted as additional evidence in the case. Thank you for taking the time to view this instructional video on the electrostatic detection apparatus. If you have any questions, please contact the San Diego Sheriff's Regional Crime Laboratory at 858-467-4600 and ask for the question documents section. Okay, so that was a demonstration of the ESTA machine, again, uh, electrostatic detection apparatus. Uh, that machine was actually developed by the London College of Printing in 1975. They were trying to raise uh, fingerprints on cloth, uh, unsuccessfully, but on the piece of cloth that they were using was a laundry label, and up came the impressions of handwriting. So purely by accident, it was uh, discovered and implemented, and the machine has uh, remained pretty much the same um, since then. Uh, it's a very simple machine, but very, very effective. Um, any cases, I guess, cases involving bank robbery notes, uh, threatening notes, anonymous documents, suicide notes, and notepads must be processed with, with the ESTA. Uh, one note of caution is that if the document uh, goes uh, for um, processing for fingerprints with anhydrin, for example, uh, once the document gets wet, mm -hmm. all the impressions are lost. Mm -hmm. So the document has to come to the question mm -hmm. document section first. Uh, there are protocols in place at many labs uh, to ensure that, the, that the, there's no DNA contamination between the ester plate and the, do and the document. Uh, so um, in any investigation like this, uh, the document section should be uh, go, gone to first. Then we have an instrument called the video spectral comparator that can detect alterations and obliterations. Uh, the VSC, um, again made by the same company who makes the ESDA, um, Boston Freeman. And there's other brand names as well, other companies that make, make uh, similar instruments, but the VSC is probably the, the best known. Again, uh, like the ESDA, the VSC testing is also non-destructive. Uh, the VSC is pretty much a, a very fancy camera that we can uh, illuminate the document using uh, visible lighting, infrared radiation, or ultraviolet, ultraviolet lighting, some other different light sources, and look, then look at how those light sources or the reflection from the documents or transmissions uh, interact with various camera filters in the machine. 
and we can uh, get images of whatever we see, whatever we find, can we put it into reports or put it into court testimony so that the, uh, the finder of fact can see what we saw. It's a, again, it's a non-destructive. There are specialists in chemists who will have to, uh, who do more chemical testing. You'll need to punch samples from your document. Most document examiners uh, won't do that. You have to go to a specialized ink chemist. That would be for things like, um, are they the same ink or dating the document through inks? But the ink examinations that document examiners do are generally non-destructive. We can differentiate inks. We can never say two inks are the same or the same pen was used. All we can say is that using the techniques that we, that we tried, we cannot differentiate the inks. So this is, this is an example of uh, detecting alterations with the visual spectral comparator. This is a, an altered check written in black ballpoint pen when viewed, viewed with visible light. So basically how you would see it uh, normally. And if you look at the, you can see in the nine, the eye has a bit of a, an issue with it, but it could be just be a, a misinking pen, uh, but under the VSC. You can see clearly using uh, infrared radiation that there are two inks on that document. I'll go back to the first one. Then this is using infrared again, but this is using uh, uh, infrared luminescence, which is a different technique. But again, the, the ink behaves differently. But again, you can see clearly that there are uh, uh, at least two inks on this on this document. Uh, you, you find these in these types of documents in um, drug cases. Someone has a drug ledger or, or, or gambling, or even, even a, a, an accountant may have these types of documents where you know the Officers knock on the door and they start trying to um, erase all the entries. So this is what the notebook looks like looks like with visible light, with infrared. The top ink um, is just uh, filtered off. Now, if you have the same ink with the same pen being used, then this won't work. But if you have different inks that behave differently, then it, it will work. Uh, if you have the same ink, then it um, becomes a matter for microscopy where you have to go, go into it Look through a microscope, look at the ink strokes and see uh, what goes where and what doesn't go where and try to figure out what was, what was written. Um, we even use things like a, a Photoshop. Uh, now we use, we use quite often. We use a technique called a lab color, which is a, a function of, of, of uh, Photoshop. We also have dichroic filters that we use as well. There's a combination of techniques that we use to try to differ differentiate the inks as, as, as much as possible. But again, if you can differentiate them, we can never say that they're the same ink. All you can say is that using these techniques, we cannot differentiate the inks. Then uh, we see lots of documents now with our, our printing processes and quite often these documents uh, are altered or attempts to me to, to alter them. And this is a case involving uh, printing processes. And the top image quality is printed with, with a laser printer. The bottom image quality was written with, written with an, printed with an inkjet printer. So somebody went in and uh, tried to uh, um, fill the space in, but they used a different type of printer. And again, uh, these types of images would be what would go into report and to, to court demonstration uh, materials. Uh, staple holes, um, something as simple as, simple as a staple can be used to um, show that the page was substituted. Uh, and this one, you can see clearly one page uh, has, has, um, has uh, two holes. The other two pages have uh, four holes. Uh, I had one case in this in which it was an eight page will. Uh, and there were two pairs of staple holes and a staple uh, between those staple holes. Uh, in the presence of both attorneys, I removed the existing staple. I found that it went through pages uh, one through seven and, and eight. But the other staple holes went through pages one, three, four, five, six, and seven, not page two and not page eight. 
uh, the, the will was inkjet printed, and the inks on pages two and eight were different under the BSC than the rest of the, the inkjet printing. Uh, there was a signature that was uh, written on the first page of the will that was indented under pages three and four, but not page two. So it was fairly a substantial proof that pages two and eight had been substituted. So a simple thing as a staple um, can uh, be very evidential. This was a case that I had uh, when I was at the San Diego lab. Um, it's quite an interesting case. It was a, a double homicide. Uh, this young man had killed his girlfriend, who was 18, and then her friend, when she came to look for her, they were both 18, he buried them in a shallow grave um, in Escondido, which is a little town north of San Diego. Uh, while he was in, in custody, um, he sent a four-page uh, document to his new girlfriend um, from prison. It was written in pencil. At the back of page two, about halfway down, he says, after you read this, erase it or destroy it. Uh, she erased it and, and kept it. So the, the investigators brought it into the lab to see um, you know, if I could uh, read the, the, the erased um, entries. And again, there were, there were pencil entries that were erased, so they were a bit difficult. Uh, using the VSC, I was able to bring up some of them because uh, pencil writing uh, is made of, of graphite. And graphite is opaque to infrared, so you're able to adjust the contrast even more then. Uh, side lighting didn't, didn't help very much, and the essay didn't help very much because the papers had been um, distorted, the fibers. So using different um, lighting techniques, we look at the document from different areas uh, with oblique lighting. And then um, I, went, I went to court to a, a motion in limine in which the defense tried to keep this evidence out because the only evidence in this case was the document evidence and trace evidence, that there's no DNA evidence. Uh, so the judge says, no, I will, I will let you testify, but I want the jury to see what you saw. Uh, which um, gave me a couple of sleepless nights because it took me another 10, 12 hours to decipher these entries. So thank goodness we had Photoshop. So we took the, the best images that we, we had of the documents using oblique lighting. Then using photo merge, we stitched them together to recreate the document. Now you can see the lines uh, where the documents, uh, where the stitching was done. I left those lines in to show what was done. We could have cleaned it, cleaned it up very nicely, but I wanted the jury to, to see exactly what was done and where we are stitched. Uh, in that case, um, uh, the, 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 the handwriting was actually quite, quite um, uh, evidential, and it was uh, used towards uh, convicting this person of um, first degree murder, two first degree murders, and he got life without parole. Um, so, so it was quite, quite an interesting case. Uh, we see these more often now, uh, co computer fonts, where people try to, again, um, uh, add entries to already printed documents. And you have very, very subtle uh, differences in the fonts um, that we, we, we use to d differentiate them. Uh, for example, you have Times Roman and Times New Roman. Uh, Times Roman was introduced by Apple in 1992, uh, Times New Roman by Microsoft in 1993. And this was in, in, important in a case I had where someone claimed that the document was um, uh, typewritten in 1971. Uh, it was written, typewritten with a was, it was printed using Times New Roman, which we knew came out in 1993. So subtle differences in fonts uh, can be used to, uh, to differentiate uh, entries and to see whether any entries have been, have been added or erased. So then we come to levels of opinions, and we have what's called a nine-point scale. It's an ASTM scale uh, called uh, ESTM E165808, Guidelines for Expression Conclusions of Forensic Document Examiners. And at the top of the scale, uh, what we might call number one is identification, a definite conclusion of identity with the highest degree of certainty. Now, does this mean that we are 100% sure? No, we can never be 100% sure. For example, if I'm asked, if I, if I identify someone or identify a writer, I'm asked, how certain are you? My answer is, the only way I can be more certain is if I actually saw him write it. So is there a doubt? 
There is doubt, but there's very, very little doubt, and I'm very certain of my opinion. Then we have a strong probability, uh, which is again very persuasive, but uh, critical features are missing. For example, we may, we, we may be dealing with a, a, a photocopy, uh, maybe a poor, uh, lesser quality uh, copy, or we may have uh, a uh, limited amount of, of handwriting. And, and then you have for a probable, the evidence is strong, but uh, falls short of certainty. More likely than not, uh, indications only a few features of significance, a very weak opinion. Uh, this, is a, this is an opinion that should never be used in court. It's pretty much a, 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 an opinion for the investigators, and actually many uh, document examiners do not use indications because we find it tends to be misused. And then we go the other way down, indications did not, uh, probably did not, strong probably did not, elimination, and no conclusion. Elimination is a very difficult opinion to give because you're saying that no, there's no way that someone could have written, could have written this handwriting or, or, or signature. Uh, because handwriting is behavioral, uh, there's so many things that could affect it that what uh, you're interpreting as a difference could actually be a variation due to age, uh, illness, or medication. Um, I've had cases where someone uh, wrote their signature on the the the, the uh, um, running engine of a car. Lots of shakiness in it. Uh, everything else was fine except for the shakiness. Um, so it's a very difficult difficult conclusion to make, uh, but it, it can be done. And then we, st we start off with no conclusion. And this is the opinion that um, I guess the most frustrating to investigators and attorneys. Why no conclusion? I'll go into that um, in, the, in the next slide. I just want to say that the the pattern of thought now at, at OSAC, for example, where the standards are being developed, is that the identification and uh, elimination opinions are going to be removed. So you're going to have more like a five-point scale. We have a strong probability or probable, probably did not, strong probably did, probability did not, and no conclusion. Or and or you may have a likelihood ratio approach where you're giving a likelihood of the possibility of um, uh, uh, two assumptions or two hypotheses, which one is, is more likely than, than the other. So why do we have no conclusion? Uh, the question writing is of limited quantity. Um, this is one of the problems that we had, in, especially in, in, in uh, um, labs like the uh, San Diego Sheriff's Lab and any other uh, law enforcement labs is that quite often we have a, a very small amount of, of, of hand, handwriting to deal with. For example, if you have a date, it just may not be enough in there to identify someone. You have to remember with handwriting, handwriting is meant to be read. It's meant to be easily understood. A signature is meant to be an identifier. So I tend to treat signatures differently from handwriting. And there are uh, uh, neuroscience uh, theories that would, uh, would uh, support this, theories of uh, uh, motor control and uh, on uh, motor programs. Then you have the, the question writings were too distorted or disguised, which is uh, someone trying to change their handwriting, which can be done sometimes successfully, sometimes not so su successfully. The, um, the, the, the less amount of writing you have, the more successful the disguise can be. And sometimes the examiner can say it's disguise. I can't say who, who, who did it. Uh, the known writings, again, are too limited or contain disguise or, or distortion. Uh, the known writings do not contain uh, characters present in the question writing. And this happens more often than you would think. And I will give you one really bad example that I had in San Diego. Um, the question writing was, uh, let's say, uh, John Lentini was the signature. The investigator got the defendant or the suspect to sit down and write 15 times, Freddie the freeloader fell on the floor. And this is just very, very frustrating to any examiner and frustrating to the investigator as well, because then we say, sorry, we, we can't help it. There's nothing comparable here. So no conclusion is um, can be frustrating, but is also useful as well. Uh, and again, it depends on some, sometimes attorneys call us to say we have no conclusion and for, for these reasons. So for uh, uh, training, um, again, and we have some parallels with, uh, with fire investigation uh, in, in the beginning. Right now, for example, mem membership of the um, 
American Academy of Forensic Sciences Question Document Section, American Society of Question Document Examiners, and the American Board of Forensic Document Examiners require a minimum of a four-year bachelor's degree. And we see most people coming in now are coming, coming in with master's degree. There are other certifying boards. There's another board certified uh, through the Forensic Specialties Accreditation Board, BFTE. Uh, they may have uh, uh, different requirements. I'm not certain of their requirements. And there may be other boards, uh, alleged boards, who are not accredited by FSAB. Uh, the ASQDE, AAFS, and ABFD require a minimum two to three year full time training program. When I trained back in 1986, it was two years. When I um, uh, had trainees uh, back in 2005, 2006, it was three years because there's so much more to do now with, for example, just uh, printers and photocopiers are a whole other, other module that needs to, be, needs to be learned. And you still have to learn about typewriting because you never know when it's going to come, come up in a cold case. Um, you have, must have a, a continuing education. Uh, if you're certified by the American Board of Forensic Document Examiners, you have to um, collect 40 points over a five-year period, which is achieved through um, attending uh, conferences, presenting papers, publishing papers, and um, doing other professional activities acceptable to the to the board and other uh, boards may have the same sort of sort of uh, requirements uh, for the american society of question document examiners uh research and publication requirements uh, are required to become a member of asqde you have to present a paper at an annual meeting uh to become a member and to maintain your membership you have to present the paper at least once every three years otherwise uh, unless you have extenuating circumstances, um, maybe you give them a, a, a one-year waiver, but after, after that, you're out. Even for guests coming to the meetings, uh, guests are allowed to attend three times, and then they have to present a paper. When the ASQD was founded back in 1942, um, it was founded by uh, Albert S. Osborne, and the, the function of society, as he saw it, was for research, and he wanted everyone to participate. He, he didn't want anyone being baggage. And that's the same principles we use now. Human performance factors and scientific and technological advances often drive the research needs um, in forensic disciplines. Linton, what type of research has been done related to forensic document examination, and what are the current research needs? Uh, they, the, the, the one of the main critiques of, of, of handwriting uh, by some, some law, law professors is that, look, we don't need handwriting examiners. The, the, a, a jury can do this. It's handwriting, how, how difficult can, can it be? Now, as I said earlier, handwriting is taught so that everyone can read it, everyone can understand it. So everyone's handwriting will have, will, will have a, um, a, some sort of, some uh, uh, characteristics that are similar to a group of people. So the first set of testing that was done was to say, okay, are the experts actually better than the lay people? And testing was done by Professor Cam at Drexel University and also by doctors uh, found in Rogers at La Trobe University in Australia uh, independently. And both results found that the experts uh, performed the lay people significantly, uh, especially when it came to identifying a, a, a uh, simulation. Now, I cannot say the, the word forgery. Forgery is a legal term. So I would never testify to something being a forgery. I could testify to being a simulation of someone else's signature or, or handwriting. Uh, so that was one of the, the, the initial gaps. Then uh, uh, Tom Bastrick, who's a document examiner locally in, in, in this area, um, but, but the University of Central Florida, they have just completed a really interesting study on measuring the frequency of occurrence of handwriting characteristics in the US population. For example, how many times does this type of E occur in the population? And there could be like eight different types of, of uppercase upper E's. So that's a very interesting um, research. It was just published through, the, through NIJ. And um, that's going to be ongoing research. I know that Tom is now doing research in, um, uh, similar research in, in numbers. How, how often do, do these type of numbers occur? And I think uh, the aim of that eventually is to develop a database or databases where an examiner can go into the database and come up with a quantitative factor for the frequency of occurrence of this, this character or this combination of characters, which would help 
a long way to moving the the uh, examination process from being subjective to more objective, which is the which is the key. Uh, empirical research is, is being done. Uh, Dr. Mauro Molino at the University of Ken uh, Kentucky, I'm sorry, Kentucky State University, uh, just completed a three-year project through NIJ and published a 1,500-page report available on uh, the NIJ's website. And what she did was, she, again, she looked at experts and laypersons using eye-tracking techniques. With eye tracking, uh, the Toby eye tracker, you sit and you look at the signatures, uh, the question signature, the known signatures, and the eye tracker tracks to see what you're looking at and what you're spending more time on. And she found differences in behaviors between the experts and the laypersons. And again, the experts significantly perform, outperform the laypersons. Again, particularly when it came to, to, uh, to I'll, I'll use the word forgeries so everyone can understand. But if you think of it, you know, at Christmas or you know, uh, February 14th, people get cards and, oh yes, I know this handwriting because you, you're meant to recognize the handwriting. Yet, you know, at Christmas time, you see a card, you don't have to look at the return address, you know who had. So it is um, you know, e easily uh, identifiable by, by most people, genuine writing. The problem is if someone simulate, you know, Anne Viv's handwriting, that's when the late person tends to fall down because it's very, very difficult. They also may tend to um, not appreciate the various factors that can go into um, affecting the, the behavior of, of, of handwriting. Uh, I had one case a couple, a couple of years ago in which there were 12 question signatures. And when I first looked at it, I said, these don't look good. And then I got the gentleman's medical records that had over 300 signatures over five years. And his signatures changed from hour to hour depending on his medication. Hmm. It, was, it was just fascinating. Mm -hmm. So for a lay person looking at these things, they would say, okay, yeah, they, these are different, but they don't factor in the causes, the what that causes variation. Mm -hmm. and that's another reason why they, a document examiner may some, sometimes say, you know, time out, we're inconclusive. Mm -hmm. There's so, so much going on here that we can't explain, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So a lot of um, we, we're encouraging uh, our um, pr practitioners to engage with academia in empirical mm -hmm. research at the American Society of Question Document Examiners meeting um, in San Diego in August of this year. Uh, the first half day will be a workshop by NIJ and NIST on research grants, how mm -hmm. to apply for grants, and th things like that. Uh, most document examiners have said they will, they will not be researchers, they you know, uh, bachelor's degree, master's degrees. So we need the, uh, the arrangements with the um, statisticians and so on to develop research projects to validate what we do. And even say, hey, you know what, you guys can't do that, or you're not, you're not, if you're not uh, uh, um, good enough, we need to know that and we need to either make it better or tell the courts, sorry, we, we, not, we, we can't testify to this again because it, do, it doesn't meet the, the, the bar. So this is the CAM studies, uh, error rates. This was published in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. Uh, so he found that professional document examiners are significantly better than college-educated non-experts in performing writer identification. Another study, he found that professional document examiners incorrectly identify 6.5% of unknown documents with documents. Laypersons are incorrectly identified 38.3% of these documents. So the laypersons were nearly six times more likely to make an error than the expert. This was our signatures. The document examiners experienced a 0.49% error rate. The laypersons, 6.47%, so nearly 13 times uh, more likely. Again, as I said, uh, signatures should be treated differently because uh, signatures are a small amount of writing and it tends to be overlearned. Uh, as, as, a, as a quick example, uh, it's found that people with, with Alzheimer's who are losing their uh, capacity to write, um, they're their handwriting deteriorates more faster than their signatures, which is important because if you have a holographic will, the handwriting may look pretty bad, but the signature may look pretty good. And also found that uh, um, a men deteriorate faster than women. Uh, again, using um, uh, hand-printed documents, uh, professional document examiners, 9.3% uh, error rate, laypersons, 40.45% error rate. The Troop study, again, uh, similar studies, different populations, uh, different scientists working on this, um, got very similar results uh, to the CAM study. So 
the studies by, by Dr. Cam and Dr. Found, who unfortunately Dr. Found uh, passed away last October um, in a very untimely manner, um, repeatedly confirmed that experts significantly perform lay persons in handwriting examination tasks. So if you have a, a case before a jury, uh, you don't want the jury making the decision as to whether this handwriting is, is genuine or, or non-genuine. Furthermore, if you, if you um, try to get handwriting excluded, let's say you're, you're a prosecutor, if you're a defense attorney, you want to get the handwriting excluded and you do, then it means that also your expert is excluded. So you have sort of a, a double whammy there where the two expert opinions uh, can, be, can come into court. So the, the absence of expert testimony can lead to incorrect conclusions uh, by lay, lay persons. This doesn't mean that experts can be wrong. Um, the evidence has shown that, but the error rate is much lower than uh, lay persons. Also remember that with the, with the lay persons, they're going to have a, a, a short amount of time to examine these documents uh, in a jury room, for example. They, they may have poor quality copies. And there may be peer pressure involved in these examinations. There may be one very strong-minded member of the juror, jury who sort of leads the, the rest. So um, I would recommend highly that um, you know, let, let the experts testify. So if you look at our expert witness credentials, uh, the, the document examiners should be board certified. So there are two boards certified through the forensic special uh, Specialties Accreditation Board as the American Board of Forensic Document Examiners, uh, and, then, and, there's, and then there's the Board of Forensic Document Examiners. Uh, the, the experts should be a member of the question document section of AAFS. And this is important, not just, not just a member of AAFS, but a member of the question document section, because we have specific requirements for document examiners, uh, but particularly when it comes to, to training. Uh, for membership. So you can join any member of the academy, for example, uh, the uh, general section, um, but unless, if you're, on a, if you're not a properly trained document examiner, you will not be allowed into the question document section. Similar requirements for organizations such as the ASQD, American Society of Question Document Examiners, uh, must, must have a two to three year training program full time. Other organizations say they're okay with a maybe four to five years part-time. Uh, there's no testing to be done as to which of these are, are better, if any, any are better. That testing, I, th I think, uh, should be done. And then, does, does your witness, um, is your witness uh, professionally active? Do they give workshops? Do they attend and particip participate in conferences? And participate is also important. You can attend many conferences and don't pick up anything. Some people, some people go to a conference, they pay the fee, and then you don't see them until the banquet night or something like that. Uh, so it's important that they participate, they present um, in, in, the, in these conferences, and see how active your witness is. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Um, John, we're going to look at some of those same topics as related to um, fire analysis. And the flashover video that we saw in the very beginning, it really illustrates how difficult it can be to obtain evidence and, and make determinations in fire-related investigations. So what type of research has been done related to what can and cannot um, be reliably determined in fire investigations? Certainly there hasn't been enough uh, research done. Uh, in fire analysis. Back in the day, we used to light condemned houses on fire, put them out too soon uh, in order to teach people to recognize arson. Um, we've learned since that in order to do uh, proper research, you've got to let that fire burn long enough so that it simulates the actual experience of the fire investigator. Um, so what we do um, now, um, the uh, analysis is, and the research is, is done mainly by fire protection engineers. They were the ones that had all the money and ran all the good tests back in the day. Um, but they were interested in how to prevent flashover, how long flashover was going to take. And they ran hundreds of tests and never once went in and looked at the aftermath, which was a, a horrible waste. But that's the way it was. Um, the fire protection engineers, people that are designing sprinkler systems and buildings, um, would run the tests. Um, investigators now piggyback onto that. So, um, for example, Underwriters Laboratories is running uh, a series of uh, tests on ventilation for firefighting, but we're also using it 
as fire investigation. Uh, investigators used to really hate scientists. Uh, they, they weren't from a scientific background. Most investigators were firefighters who somehow became fire investigators. Early on, it was actually punishment duty or duty for people who could no longer extinguish fires. They would be put in the investigation unit. Um, now, it's, it's, it's a much more desirable uh, position to have, but for a long time, until, until the turn of the century, and I mean this century, uh, people looked down on scientists and they thought that the scientists didn't uh, contribute to uh, fire investigation. But things are, things are better uh, since, uh, since 2000. So <clears throat> you saw the, the video. Um, and it showed the floor burning. It used to be that low-level burning was considered uh, an indicator of arson because everybody knows fire burns up and out. Um, and so if it burns down, it must have had help. Somebody must have used an accelerant. That's not true. Um, but people thought that for years and years. And so we spent most of the 1990s trying to educate the fire investigation community. Uh, and again, these people are sometimes resistant to change or education, but trying to tell them that, look, if a fire gets fully involved, it's going to burn the floor. As a result of learning about flashover, we learned that floors burn in unaccelerated fires. Uh, you saw that chair started on mm -hmm. fire. Uh, mm -hmm. There was no gasoline in the room. And yet, before we were done, the carpet was burning. And after that fire, if somebody had gone in and documented it, they would have seen that the floor was all burned. This would have been uh, thought of as something that uh, indicated arson back in the day. And this was, mm -hmm. that, that film was from 1984. Mm -hmm. um, so in the 1990s, uh, the fire professionals, the fire scientists tried to teach the rest of the fire investigation world not to get so excited about burning on the floors, even irregular burning on a floor. It happens during a fire. And it took a while to, to teach people uh, not to call a fire arson just because the floor was burned. And we finally, I think, persuaded just about everybody that that's the case. Uh, there, there is a rear guard. Um, most of that rear guard has got hair the color of mine or less hair. Uh, they tend mm -hmm. to be the old people that just never accepted that uh, floors can burn. So currently, uh, the emphasis that we have is on getting investigators to understand the effects of ventilation and how that might impact the determination of the area of origin. Um, now, finding the area of origin is a fire investigator's core competence. That's what they're supposed to be good at. Um, there has been some research recently that has led us to believe that fire investigators maybe aren't all that good at determining the area of origin. And this is because of a, a lack of understanding of ventilation. This is a test that was conducted in Las Vegas at a arson investigators meeting in 2005. That's an ATF agent standing outside that uh, test burn cell that's been set up as a bedroom. Uh, they lit it on fire and allowed it to burn beyond flashover. Uh, you can see the uh, the, the air goes in the bottom, the, the smoke and fire comes out the top. And what happened was we had 53 people uh, attending the conference, and they were asked to go into this room and pick a quadrant, a quadrant uh, where the fire started. And most investigators picked the um, quadrant directly across from the door as the place where the fire started because there was a large fire pattern on the wall there. It went all the way to the uh, floor, all the way to the ceiling. It was the heaviest and deepest char in the room. The actual origin, unfortunately, was in the upper left quadrant. And here's the fire pattern. Uh, this is uh, a V-shaped pattern. It's caused by the intersection of a conical fire plume there was a, a trash can below that white area, and the, the plume came up and scorched the wall. Hmm. Unfortunately, 
Now, even though this pattern survived the fire, uh, most of the fire investigators didn't recognize the importance of that plume, and they were misled by uh, the other one. So, uh, this is a slide from uh, the ATF uh, agent who ran the test, and uh, he said 53 experienced fire investigators were asked to examine the scene and indicate which quadrant they thought the fire invested fire originated in. Uh, I've, I've changed that to 53 participating individuals for reasons we'll get into, uh, but um, they, they might not have all been uh, experienced fire investigators. But here's the pattern that everyone thought, or that a lot of people thought was the origin of the fire. Three of the 53 got it right. Uh, not one person determined the actual point of origin, but three out of 53 found the uh, upper left quadrant to be where the fire started. Uh, not a very impressive uh, error rate. Well, actually, it was impressive. It was over 90% got it wrong. And when the word of this test got out, uh, this is when the spin machine started in earnest. Uh, people tried to explain it. They said, oh, really, it's okay. Fire investigators know what they're doing. Uh, this is an anomaly. Uh, they said, oh, that's not valid data. Uh, investigators weren't allowed to shovel out the scene. They weren't allowed to conduct interviews or collect samples, and some of the people are not qualified. Well, you could have shoveled that scene completely out. You could have interviewed the, the witnesses that saw it coming out the door. They would have still gotten it wrong. Um, and, and in terms of the qualifications, uh, there is a fine line between a numerator and a denominator. Only a fraction of you will get this. Uh, <laughs> but there's only so much you can do with the data. If you want to say that instead of having 53 qualified investigators, we had only 30 qualified investigators, you still got only three people getting it right. You can't fix that number three. So. They repeated the experiment. Uh, this time they did it a uh, little uh, more, with, with more instrumentation in an indoor laboratory. Uh, this is at the ATF uh, Fire Research Laboratory in Amondale, Maryland. They actually rebuilt the building. They instrumented it with thermocouples and uh, gauges to measure uh, different uh, concentrations of gases and anemometer to measure the wind speed in and out. and they, they did a pretty good job of reproducing the, the fire. They also modeled it. Uh, computer fire modeling is a very interesting uh, discipline. Um, it, it's got its uses to, to help people understand what's going on in a fire. And this is the uh, production of that big fire pattern uh, coming in the door. It was 150 kilowatts per square meter. That's a lot of kilowatts. It's like 10 space heaters in a three by three foot space. It's a lot of energy. And it creates a pattern that looks like this. Now, what they did uh, with the model was they asked it to show the oxygen concentration. And this is just before, uh, 12 seconds after flashover, this is the oxygen concentration. And eight inches above the floor, you can see the oxygen coming in the bottom of the door. And what we have hypothesized is that we've got this thing called a floor jet, where this blast of cold, fresh air comes in at the bottom of the opening while the smoke is going out the top. And this is just uh, its simple mass balance. If you have a whole lot of smoke coming out the top, something's going to replace that, and that's the air that will come in the bottom of that doorway. Uh, this is a sideways view of it, and the oxygen is in red. And there's almost no oxygen at the top of the wall there. Uh, there's the only place where there's any oxygen is right opposite that, uh, right at the doorway. That's where the, the fresh air is coming in. You can't have burning without oxygen. And so the oxygen actually takes over, and what we call this is a ventilation controlled fire. Again, there's the path of the oxygen coming in. So the experiment with uh, individuals was, was repeated in 2007 in Oklahoma City. This time there were three different fires, 70 fire investigators, and they had the first fire, they allowed it to burn for 30 seconds beyond flashover and then extinguished it. 
Um, most of the fires that we investigate as fire investigators uh, have burned for several minutes beyond flashover, maybe several tens of minutes beyond flashover, but we've got to start somewhere. Uh, the second fire went for 70 seconds beyond flashover, and a third fire uh, went for three minutes beyond flashover. And like they did in uh, Las Vegas, they asked these fire investigators to go through and pick a quadrant. So in the first fire, <coughs> we got uh, <coughs> excuse me, 70 responses out of 70 people. 59 were correct. So we had a 16% error rate. Not, <coughs> not a particularly good result, but that's what it was. The second fire, there were six people that decided uh, undetermined. They did not pick a quadrant. Of the 64 who responded, 44 got it correct. Uh, we're talking about 31% error rate with a one-minute fire. And the third fire, <coughs> excuse me, there's something in my throat. The third fire, we had 53 responses, so there were 17 people elected not to pick a quadrant. 13 were correct. That's 25%. When you think about it, that's uh, two coin tosses. You could go into the room, um, blindfold yourself, spin around in a circle, and pick a quadrant at random, and that you would have 25% correct. There's this, another experiment in 2012 uh, done with uh, photographs and uh, data. There were 587 people, fire investigators, elected to participate. Demographics were uh, gathered from all of these people. They viewed photos and data from a fire that burned for only one minute beyond flashover. One minute. Um, again, and not very realistic. We had a 22 to 26% error rate in that test. So the error rate is, in determining origin based on reading fire patterns, is pretty high. To date, there is no peer-reviewed literature that shows that fire investigators' use of pattern interpretation to determine the origin leads to correct results if the fire burned fully involved for more than three minutes. None. So this is, this is one avenue where fire investigators uh, would love to have the error rate that document examiners have. Um, and, and it's one area where they can be uh, challenged on the reliability of their methodology because so far uh, the profession has been unable to prove that it knows what it's doing when determining origin. So what we've learned is that the availability of oxygen is what controls the progress of a fully involved structure fire. And what we're going to show now is a, an illustration of that. It's a very uh, elegant experiment involving igniting heptane, uh, which is very similar to gasoline in its uh, properties, uh, in a closed compartment. So we have this pool of heptane. Uh, it's been lit on fire, and it's burning in a place where there's limited ventilation. There is a slit cut into the top of the box on the right, and another one cut into the bottom of the box on the right. So the uh, products of combustion can go out the top, and the air can come in the bottom. And you can see now that there's, there's sort of a wind uh, that's apparent that's blowing from right to left, where the air is coming in. As time goes by, though, the flame moves completely off of the pool. And it will do this for a little while and it make the most remarkable transition because what's happening is the box is filling up with the products of combustion, with heptane vapors that aren't burning, and the oxygen in the compartment is being depleted. And just about now, the only place where there's any oxygen available is over in the lower right. That's where it's coming in. And the fire moves completely over there. And there's going to be, if this was a, a compartment with furniture, there would be much more damage around this, where the oxygen comes in, as opposed to where the fuel is or where the fire started. The fire is burning much more intensely 
where there is oxygen and not at all where we know the fire started above the, uh, the heptane. So this controls everything. It's a very elegant little experiment. Um, we can move on, I think. There we go. Fire analysis research is uh, expensive in both time and materials. Um, that little experiment that I just showed didn't cost a whole lot, but it, it took a while to set it up. But setting up full-sized fire experiments is very, very difficult. Um, the best experiments that we conduct these days happen if we can find a hotel or an apartment building where all of the floor plans are exactly alike and we can repeat the experiment over and over and see what changes and what doesn't. But there are uh, so many uh, different variables and different ways you can change your fire just by opening a window uh, early in the fire or having it open late in the fire or leaving a door open or uh, changing uh, a couch for a, a chair. All of those things make it very difficult to uh, simplify and generalize what's going on. But what we do know, what we have learned, is that oxygen is what's in charge. And when the uh, flashover occurs, the oxygen concentration goes from like 21% in a room down close to zero. And the temperature immediately begins to drop when the oxygen gets used up. So that's where we are with, uh, with fire research. Are there... Um are there universities uh, that are studying this type of information? How is the funding? Is the funding um, coming through? We are getting some funding now from uh, the National Institute of Justice as a result of that 2009 report. It mentioned the NAS fire. Report, yes. The NAS mm -hmm. report. It mentioned fire. And mm -hmm. so fire is a forensic science. Yes. It's officially a forensic science, <laughs> something that uh, not a lot of fire investigators will, will necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. they, they will say, I'm not a scientist, I'm a fire investigator. Well, that was okay in the 70s. Yeah, and yeah specifically, I think uh, I, have, I have a portion of that report, and it says, quote, Expert, or, uh, experiment should be designed to put arson investigation on a more solid scientific footing. So do you, um, has, that been, has that progressed? It has, actually, uh, surprisingly. Uh, mm -hmm. I saw almost exactly those words in a report that was uh, produced in 1977, <laughs> saying that we needed to do a lot more research to put mm -hmm. uh, fire investigation on a more solid scientific footing. And not much happened, but there, there is work now that's happening. Um, NIJ particularly has funded a number of groundbreaking experiments, um, some of which are run over at the uh, ATF laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll bring in an outside mm -hmm. contractor that's got the grant, mm -hmm. and they use the, the okay. facilities at the ATF laboratory. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of interesting work happening, but it, mm -hmm. it, it's really slow. Mm -hmm. um, what should it, an attorney look for in uh, a, an expert in the area of fire analysis? Um, yeah, hopefully you want to look for somebody that owns at least a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. um, you won't find that in about half of the fire investigation world. But, I mean, if you're looking for an expert to uh, assist in a, in a criminal defense, for example, uh, you want someone with some experience doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, you want someone who has been certified and who continues to be certified. Um, and there's people that aren't certified that hold themselves out as, as experts, but mm -hmm. uh, those people are likely to get beaten up. And you want to you want to vet them uh, with NFPA 1033. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, yeah, here we go. Yeah. So you look at their. Uh, Credentials. You look at their track record. Uh, you got to especially make sure that they know how to talk to a jury. Um, some of, some fire experts have have tremendous stores of knowledge, but aren't able to effectively communicate that to someone who doesn't have that big store of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you want to not necessarily look for somebody that's old because age and experience are uh, not exactly the same thing. Um, you can have a person with 20 years experience, or you can have a person with one year of experience that he's repeated 19 times. Uh, it just depends on what they learn from their experience. So 
you just talk to them. Make mm -hmm. sure that that they can uh, articulate what is uh, a, a difficult subject mm -hmm. and yeah. somebody that appreciates what a difficult subject it is. If, if they say they're looking for the, the lowest and deepest char, you probably want to talk to someone else. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can continue on. With All right. Yeah. So the literature uh, that a capital case litigator would want to become familiar with uh, is, is first of all NFPA 921. This is the guide for fire and explosion investigations. It's now in its ninth edition. It was first published in 1992. Um, a lot of people hated it when it came out. Um, but since then, uh, right around the turn of the century, people decided that they had better accept that um, scientific method for investigating fires is the only way to go. NFPA 1033 is a much smaller document. This is the one that is a standard for qualifications uh, for a fire investigator. Now, uh, NFPA 921 is a guide. Uh, and you can ask someone, why didn't you follow NFPA 921? And they will say, it's only a guide. Well, that's true. Then you say, well, why didn't you follow the guide? instead of why didn't you follow the standard? Mm -hmm. now, the question is the same, but with NFPA 1033, uh, it's a standard. It applies to everyone who investigates fires, uh, whether they're a chemist or an engineer or a fire investigator. Anyone who's involved has got to have the basic minimum qualifications. And this can be used by a court uh, during a qualifications challenge. I mean, this is, this is a standard that the profession has imposed on itself, and it would provide a lot of guidance to a judge in determining whether uh, the person is qualified. I was once in a uh, courtroom uh, where the fire marshal got up on a witness chair and was, was asked to describe the combustion of hydrogen, which is the simplest of all combustion reactions. And the fire marshal looked like a deer in the headlights. And the judge, uh, Sua Sponte, popped up and said, uh, I'm sorry, if you don't know H2O, you will not be rendering opinion testimony in my courtroom. And any time they got even close to an opinion, the judge said, that sounds like an opinion. Mm -hmm. And a person was limited to uh, uh, being a fact witness and as such um, was not very effective and the defendant was acquitted. I didn't have to testify. Mm -hmm. This document here was produced by the Department of Justice in 2000. And what it says is, Follow NFPA 921, please. Uh, if you've got a dead body, if you think it's an incendiary fire, if it's a really big fire, follow NFPA 921. It's right in there. Um, it's, it's very effective if the uh, witness wants to resist NFPA 921. Because if they don't accept it as authoritative, then of course they, you're not allowed to cross-examine them on the document if they don't accept it as authoritative. Um, most fire investigators know better than to not accept it as authoritative, but some of them don't. And there's, there's ways to, to get them to say, well, everybody else says it's an authority. This is a new book uh, just out um, in February of this year, uh, Forensic Science Reform, and it has a chapter on arson in it, written by yours truly. And it's got a study of the Cameron Todd Willingham case out of Texas, which uh, chastened the authorities in Texas to the point where Texas is now the leader mm -hmm. in uh, forensic science reform. And finally, there's this book, mm -hmm. which is written uh, to be accessible to people uh, that don't have a uh, science degree. Uh, plain language, it's written for the, the average fire investigator, but I, I have found that attorneys are able to grasp it pretty well. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, Linton, I know that when I was uh, doing some research, I was looking at uh, the Scientific Working Group for Document Examiners on their website, and they have, their, they have quite a few standards. Um, Available and accessible, um, so that's that's a good you know that's a good place, um, a good reference point. Are there any other reference points and and uh, validation methodologies that um, that would be uh, important to know? Right. Yeah. The um, uh, the, the uh, Swing Dog website www.swgdoc.org uh, still up and running. Uh, Swing Dog 
which is the uh, scientific working group for documents, is no longer funded, um, but um, through one generous examiner, they keep they keep they have uh, kept the website up and running just in case. Um, on that website, you can download about uh, I think about 19 standards. Most of these standards have been published uh, through ASTM. Um, Unfortunately, if you go to ASTM, um, you'll, you'll have to pay about 30 bucks to get a copy of, of, of the standard. Uh, now that the, the American Academy of Forensic Sciences has established the Academy Standards Board, it is um, hoped that standards developed through OSAC or from other um, areas will be published throughout through the Academy Standards Board, which is a standards development organization. Um, those will be uh, uh, free to the public. So that's is the plan the future. Uh, hopefully it'll be, it'll be successful. Uh, the Academy Standards Board is working under a grant right now. And um, again, it, it all depends on, on funding. Uh, just regard to the, regards to the, the studies, um, we have the Mauro Bellino study founded through NIJ, uh, the Bastrick study through NIJ. And uh, Lisa Hansen and Professor Shrihari, uh, Lisa Hansen was a document examiner in Minnesota, and Professor Shrihari is at the University of Buffalo in uh, New York, State University of New York in Buffalo. Uh, they did a, lo a longitudinal study, um, NIJ-funded research, looking at uh, students over a number of years as they progressed through the grades, and saw how, look at how their handwriting changed. So these were the uh, three of the major NIJ product, projects over the past few years. Um, there has been criticism of the recognized methodology. Say, people say, you guys say, um, you, you know what you do, but no one else knows what, what, you, what you do. You know, what exactly do you do? So we need uh, various black box studies. And in that, um, you have, for example, questioned and known writings or, or signatures or printers or whatever. And you, they're submitted blind to an examiner or group of examiners, and then we get, we get an error rate back. Say, so how good are these examiners are determining whether these things are authentic or, or non-authentic? And then we have uh, white box studies which um, need to be done as to, you know, what is exactly going on in the examiner's mind? Dr. Merlino's study at Kentucky State University using the eye tracking was a semi-white box study, white box and, and black box study. We need much more of those, those types of studies. Uh, handwriting is, is behavioral, and I want, I want to emphasize that it does not mean personality. As John had in his slide, you, know, you have gasoline, you have heptane, which behave similarly. And you have other, other flammable substances that may have different behaviors. Handwriting is similar in that people behave differently. They may, they may uh, if you're standing up and writing, if you're writing at a counter, if you're sitting, if you're lying in bed writing on your pillow, you know, a page or document on your pillow, that may affect your handwriting. There's lots of variations uh, in your handwriting. Uh, in one of the major texts on in document examination, handwriting examination, Facts and Fundamentals by Huber and Hedrick, they list about 20 factors that must be considered. Now, all of these must be researched. There must be empirical research that goes into this. It has to be f uh, funded, of course. Uh, there are lots of small studies going around by individuals. Uh, right now, there's some research between the uh, University of California, uh, San Diego, Dr. Professor Michael Caligiuri, with uh, examiners at uh, LAPD and LASO, and myself included in that, looking at, at, at uh, hand printing, looking at, at, at uh, kinematic studies. The kinematic studies look at what's exactly happening when, when, you're, when you're writing. So we use like a, a Wacom tablet. Uh, you, you pick up the handwriting, and it goes through um, a laptop running movalizer software. And there are about 26 parameters that we can look at, like speed, velocity, pen pressure, uh, amount of tremor, things like, like, like that. So that can give us a, a pretty good idea of what's actually happening in the, um, in the, when, when someone's writing. And then we need to see how good examiners can evaluate that from a static signature. On, on ink line on, on, on paper. So, that, so first of all, we need, we need to know the underlying, the ground truth, and then how good is the examiner at getting that ground truth through observing a, a static signature. The other um, uh, area of research that's going to be very active is research into digital signatures. Uh, you know, you go to many, um, well, point of sales areas, and you actually sign with a stylus on a plastic pad, or sometimes you even sign with your your finger. 
uh, some research has been going, going on into that. The first time I was asked to sign with my finger, I told the guy, why just don't take my print? And that's more reliable than me signing with, with my finger. And anyone who, who signed with their finger knows, you know, is, is very different every, every time you sign. However, some people have been doing some research on that, and um, the results have been fascinating that it's actually quite quite uh, individual. Uh, Tani Juhus at La Trobe University in, in Melbourne, um, she completed a PhD thesis last year, two years ago. And one of, one of her chapters, which was not published, was a, um, looking at uh, using a similar uh, uh, Wacom tablet. When you write with a pen, the tablet can pick up up to about five centimeters above the paper. So it captures what's called the air strokes. Now, in document examination now, you can, we can say that something, a, a signature, is, is a uh, uh, simulation not written by the journeying person. Who did the simulation? That's very, very mm -hmm. difficult to, especially if it's a good simulation. So generally we say, yes, we can say it's a simulation. Who did it? Um, we, can, we can say that, generally. But with the, the digital signature, with the research that Tanya has done, we found that the air strokes are very individual to the writer. So someone simulating, uh, they don't even know what, what, they can look at the ink on the paper, but they have no idea what their hand is doing off the paper. And it's consistent throughout. So we can say, yeah, that's a simulation, and person A is a simulator. So I think that's gonna be the future of uh, uh, signature examination, and quite a bit of, of research will be going in, into those areas. We do have a question, and that is, um, what are white and black box studies? Okay, a black box study is uh, so basically you want to, to know um, how reliable uh, uh, this profession is at this particular task. You don't want to know how they do it. You just want to know are they reliable or not. What is, what is the error rate? For example, in question documents, you may give uh, a group of... Uh, question signatures and a group of, of uh, uh, specimen signatures. And then looking at how often the, the correct answers arrived at, you can tell, okay, these people have a 90% 90 accuracy rate, 95%, or if, it, if it's down to like 60%, okay, well maybe uh, they shouldn't be, shouldn't be testifying to this particular task in court. So these are, these are what the black box studies are for. I know that there have been some done in, in uh, fingerprints and I think in firearms as well. Uh, the, the white box study, you pretty much go into the methodology, methodology to look at what the exam is actually, the, the training, what they're actually looking at, and how they're developing the, their opinion. Basically, how do they arrive at the basis for their opinion? And um, do, they do, do, they, do they do the same time every time? Um, are they, are they uh, certain tasks that give more problems than other tasks using, using the same uh, uh, methods? So those are, uh, would be the, the white box studies. Okay. Thank you. Um, of particular interest to our target audience, um, what tips could you provide for working with an expert witness um, in forensic document examination? Uh, the first thing I could tell any attorney um, is please meet with your witness before testimony. Have a pre-trial conference, and I can't emphasize how important that is. You want to be on the same page with, with the expert and, and vice versa. Um, neither side wants surprises. Mm -hmm. And the, the worst example I've had of the, had in this was in San Diego when I asked the prosecutor for, for a, a pretrial uh, conference. He said, oh, no, I've dealt with you guys many times before. I, I, we don't need that. So I go into court, I'm on the stand, and the first question he asked is, uh, Mr. Mohammed, how long have you been looking at fingerprints? And I leaned back in my chair and I looked at him and said, counsel, I've never examined a fingerprint in my life. <laughs> and then he started scrambling. Mm -hmm. So uh, something as, as basic yeah. as that, and the jury was actually la laughing at him you know, because mm -hmm. it, was so, it was so basic. Um, so please have a, a pretrial uh, conference with, with, with your expert. Um, please do not try to change your expert's opinions. They must be comfortable to what they're testifying with. And most experts, I would say, uh, well-trained experts, ethical experts, will not change your opinions. And they'll give you mm -hmm. the proper weight of, this is where, what my opinion means. And some of you change to say, well, I can use you, or mm -hmm. no, we'll, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we'll mm -hmm. have, have another um, uh, trial technique. 
And do you have some suggestions for uh, cross-examination and direct yes. um, examination yeah. strategies that, that would be useful? Yes, again, with, with direct examination, uh, the examiner should have uh, demonstrative charts. Uh, Wilson Harrison, who is one of uh, uh, British document examiner, uh, passed away now many years ago, uh, said that what, whatever you cannot, cannot demonstrate is not evidence. And that's something I've sort of um, been, been my mantra, because it, it keeps me honest, that, mm -hmm. okay, there's, there's no ipsy dixit. This is what I'm seeing. This is why I came to my, my opinion. I demonstrated through charts, maybe either paper charts or a, a uh, PowerPoint charts, presentation, annotated. I also do that in my, in my reports uh, for, for direct. And for, for, for direct and cross, uh, the, again, the other advice I have is keep it brief. Uh, I gave the example, um, I was talking to you earlier, I was testifying in, in Guildford Crown Court in Surrey a few years ago in a, in a um, uh, criminal case where the balance of, of uh, proof is, uh, uh, the, uh, the proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think I had testified to, to the, um, to the uh, probability that the defendant wrote the signature. So I went through my chart and everything and showed the similarities and uh, the reasons for my opinion. And the defense barrister gets up. He says, uh, Mr. Mohammed, you said my client probably wrote the signature. I said, yes, counsel. He says, so there is doubt in your mind. I said, yes. He said, thank you. No further questions. Mm -hmm. And that was, to me, was one of the best cross-examinations I've, I've ever had. It was brief. It was to the point. He got to the weight of the evidence. The jury was happy because they didn't have to listen to me go through my chart again. So I would mm -hmm. say, keep it brief, uh, cut to the chase, and uh, get to the weight of the evidence. Okay. And we do have a, another question and uh, that both of you could weigh in on. Both of you talked about OSAC and what is it and what are your two areas involved in OSAC? So I'll start with Linton and then we'll, we'll go on to, to John. Okay. After the, um, the, 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 uh, the SWIGs, the scientific working groups, uh, and there were maybe been about 20, 25 of them in each discipline, after their funding was cut, uh, OSAC, which is the uh, Organization of Scientific Area Committees, was formed and uh, funded uh, by NIST, I think, through, through NIJ. And what this does is basically uh, divided the various forensic disciplines into bodies that did similar work to what the SWIGs did in order to develop standards for the various areas of, of, of discipline. My particular era, I was on the Scientific Era Committee for uh, Pattern and Physics Evidence, which was uh, question documents, of uh, uh, prints, shoe prints, uh, uh, blood, blood spatter, and firearms. So we were trying to get all those disciplines come to a a, a uh, standardized form of, um, of thinking, a standard, standardized form of uh, uh, reporting. For example, in documents, we had the nine-point uh, scale. In f fingerprints, maybe they may, may best be identified, not identified, uh, inconclusive. So they may have three. So how can all these disciplines come to one area? That's the area that we're looking at now. And uh, the OSAC has been in existence about three years now, I, I believe. Uh, they meet once or twice a year, one, once a year. It's a big group of 520 uh, people. And you have in each group, you have uh, practitioners from federal, state, private labs. You have statisticians. You have uh, uh, academics. And then you have a, a legal resource group. You have a, a human factors re, uh, resource group. And now you also have a statisticians resource group that the various uh, working groups can consult. And where when they develop standards, it has to go through these groups first before it can be approved by the Forensic Science Standards Board. Then once those are, are approved, then it has to go through or uh, go through the Academy Standards Board, hopefully for publication. Okay. And, and John, what is your area uh, with OSAC? I'm, I'm in the fire and explosion investigation mm -hmm. subcommittee. And we have identified standards. Um, we will be making suggestions for changes to NFPA 921, NFPA mm -hmm. 1033. Mm -hmm. But um, we're not going to develop our own standards. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think the OSAC people have found out that developing standards is, is, is a harder game than, than they might have thought initially. <laughs> They thought they could write their own standards. Mm -hmm. Now they're working through other standards mm -hmm. development bodies. Okay. We are, uh, our main goal is to uh, 
do a strategic vision for fire investigation where we would like that to be in 10 years. Um, we're also hoping to write uh, a template for our quality assurance manual mm -hmm. uh, for fire investigation units. Okay. And I know our audience um, <coughs> would also like to hear um, about your tips for presenting evidence and cross and direct examination? Yes. Uh, first of all, don't try this alone. Um, most, <laughs> most attorneys are going to get uh, one or two arson cases in their career. Uh, there's, there's some people that specialize in fire cases um, in the insurance industry, but most criminal defense attorneys, uh, when they, they call me up, they say, this is my first arson case, or I had an arson case 10 years ago, this is my second arson case. You, you really want to consult with an expert. Uh, and taking a case, a fire case, to trial without an expert uh, has been found to be ineffective per se. Um, and uh, two cases I can refer you to, one is a First Circuit case where the, the lawyer himself went and walked through the fire scene. Um, the court said, that's not enough. Uh, in the second case, the uh, Ritchie versus Bradshaw, uh, this was a death penalty case out of Ohio, where counsel hired an expert, but he was determined to not be a competent expert. And it is a very interesting read, and they, they say that having a competent expert in a fire case is part of effective assistance of counsel. So, you know, when I get these cases, um, a lot of times uh, people are calling me uh, to do their due diligence. Um, when I review a case for a defense lawyer, I reach the conclusion that the public sector investigator uh, reached the right conclusion, uh, three out of four times. Um, it's, a, it's a lawyer's worst nightmare. If they call me up and I say, you know what, this is, a, this is an accidental fire and, and you have an innocent client. And so just getting them a fair trial is no longer enough. Um, so three out of four times, uh, that means I won't be uh, appearing as a witness or, or writing a report, but I may very well help counsel avoid being ineffective. And that, that's what I see as an expert's role uh, in the criminal justice system is to help counsel avoid being ineffective. At least, um, you know, there are many cases when I look at it, I say, your guy is good for it. They did it. Um, but I can help you avoid being ineffective in defending him. I know you have, you have to defend him. I don't. So um, as far as that litigation strategies, it, it's often easier to challenge the qualifications than it is to challenge the methodology. So I would say go there first. Um, either through a deposition, there's four states that allow depositions in criminal trials. Um, that's really, I, I think, a wonderful uh, way to go where si criminal trials run like civil trials. Uh, but uh, most of the states, uh, 46 states, have decided not to do that. Um, so sometimes your first shot uh, comes at trial. And I would challenge the qualifications before the investigator gets to opine. When a, uh, prosecutor says, uh, Judge, I want you to tell the jury this guy's an expert. Uh, they, they ask you, you have any questions? That, ask those questions. Do not stipulate that the guy is a, uh, an expert unless your expert consultant tells you that. Uh, don't do that on your own because just because a guy has testified a hundred times doesn't mean he's been testifying correctly or using reliable methodology. So, um, and on a cross-examination, I, I would say uh, present NFPA 921 and get the expert to either accept it or reject it. Um, you can use f fire and arson scene evidence, that picture with the fire, that uh, pamphlet with the firefighter on the cover. Um, and that says, look, the Justice Department says you ought to use 921. And there are other authorities that say 921 is authoritative, you should use it. So to the extent that they've deviated, that's where you want to focus on, uh, focus your cross-examination. Now, it's really, uh, there, there's so many things involved that it, it's really too complicated to cover all of the uh, cross-examination strategies that you might want. I have got all the resources you could possibly need, depending on your case. Um, send me an email and I'll, I'll send you a link to, to, to those resources uh, and you don't even have to retain me to do that. <laughs> Great, thank you. 
Uh, we do have a question. It's a very, uh, I think it's a, it's a very, very good question. And it's for both of you. Um, so we'll start with Linton, and that is, how do you reduce contextual bias in an examination? That's an excellent question. It's one of the really uh, hot topics in forensic science right now. Um, for the last two years, I've been part of an expert working group in human factors and handwriting examination uh, sponsored through NIST. And we had um, document examiners, uh, human factors experts, uh, statisticians, and academics and psychologists involved in this. And that report should be coming out um, probably end of this year or very early, early next year. But a lot of uh, this uh, report dealt with or deals with, with bias and how do we deal with bias. Um, the question is, how do you reduce contextual bias in, a, in an examination? As a private examiner, I would say uh, the, it starts with the attorney who calls me. Don't tell me anything. When you call me, give me the case caption. I will do a conflict check. If I have no conflict, then I, I need to know what's questioned, what is known. Do you have originals? Do you have in, uh, adequate specimens? What is your time frame in terms of um, trial coming up or hearing coming up? How, how soon do you need a report? I don't need to know that this guy was arrested 20 times for forgery before, or he's a convicted murderer, or he's, he's, he's serving time. That is bias. And one of the hardest things, hardest uh, parts of my job as a private examiner is telling an attorney on the phone, uh, don't say anything. I do, I do not want to know anything. And the less you tell me, it's better, because whatever you tell me, I take notes. If, if I'm asked in court, I'll say, this is what I was told. And did it, did it bias you? Maybe or may, maybe not. But the, the jury or the, or the judge may say, well, that must have biased this examiner more than he, he thinks. And we all, we all have biases. So I would say to the, to the attorneys and, and investigators, when you speak to your, your expert, give them as little information as possible. They may contact you or they should contact you afterwards for more specific questions about things that they see that they may want to see. With this circumstance, that may explain this particular observation. But let them ask those, those questions. So um, yeah, be, uh, be very careful in, in, in your conversations with your, with your, with your, your experts. Uh, for the examiner as well, uh, the examiner has to um, try to reduce that, that bias as, as much as possible. You don't want any background information on the, on the case. Uh, if you get too much information, sometimes you just simply refer it to another examiner. Uh, for example, in, at the San Diego Sheriff's Crime Lab, uh, where we uh, previously, if I met the detective and uh, he told me about the case, I would make sure that my colleague got the case without any of the information that, that I had. Uh, now, later on, I would have to review this case, so that may have been, um, uh, put some bias into it. So things like that have to be looked at, and, and, uh, and hopefully procedures changed to um, uh, rectify those, those sorts of uh, instances. But bias is very, 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 very important, and the attorney should know, and should ask the, the expert, what were you told about this case, or what do, what do you know about the background of this case? Right. And John? The first thing to do is to recognize that bias exists and, and try to do what you can to avoid it. But with fires, it's a little difficult. Uh, if I go up to a fire scene, and I cannot unsee the for sale sign in the front yard. Um, it's, it's there. It's, uh, I, people come up and, and tell me things that they shouldn't tell me, and I try to ignore that. Um, the, the safest thing to do is to use two investigators, uh, one to... Uh, look at the physical evidence and one to run the investigation. Uh, in fires, unfortunately, we frequently have the principal investigator, the guy who's supposed to be doing the science, is uh, also the lead prosecution witness. And he does the investigation, so he's not only trying to figure out what happened, but who done it. And I think it's, it's important, if we can manage it, to have uh, a case manager and an analyst uh, doing separate roles. And some of the best investigations that I've reviewed have been done exactly that way. And you have some unique qualifications. Um, and I know that you're certified in two areas. So could you tell us uh, about those areas and, and how many um, experts also share those that dual um, 
qualifications in both both areas? Uh, I think there are three fire investigators on the planet that know how to run the laboratory analysis as well, um, and, and I'm one of them. Um, so I, I have a unique perspective for a fire investigator in that I didn't start out as a fireman. I started out as a chemist in the laboratory, and that's, that's how I met fire investigators. They would bring me samples, and I would run them in the laboratory and tell them whether they had something or didn't. Uh, I frequently uh, told them they didn't when they might have, because we, when I first started in this business a lot of years ago, we had very insensitive methods to detect accelerants in samples. These days, we have very sensitive methods to the point where I can now detect the mineral spirits that was the thinner for the polyurethane uh, coating that was put on a floor 25 years ago. So it used to be that we could find a drop. If there was a drop of gasoline in a sample, we could find it. Uh, these days, it's about a 500th of a drop that we can find. But I branched out from the laboratory into the, the field, and I learned a lot of things that I didn't believe. Uh, I was told about shiny alligators and low burning and crazed glass and melted steel and high temperatures. It was, it was commonly thought that um, accelerated fires burned at a higher temperature than unaccelerated fires. It's not true. They burn at the same temperature. So, and I've done experiments to prove that. I, I mean, I had the, the scientific chops to actually run some experiments um, showing that a room full of newspaper will actually burn hotter than a room where they poured gasoline. What was, um, from your perspective, one of the most um, the, one of the most memorable uh, cases for you? Uh, the most memorable one is a case where I was retained by the prosecution in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, to um, help convict this guy who supposedly lit a fire that killed his wife, uh, his wife's sister, and his sister's four children. So there were six fatalities. The one survivor was this guy and his wife's four-year-old son. And the uh, chemist initially found gasoline in the sample, and I was asked to review that, and it turns out there wasn't any gasoline in the sample. Um, and I told the prosecutor that, and they said, well, we got to do something else. Um, and I looked at the, at the fire investigator's work, and I said, well, it looks like an arson. There's low burning through the doorway. There's charring on the floor. Um, and I don't think that flashover could be responsible for this. This was back before we learned much about flashover. And what we did was we actually uh, found another house that had an identical floor plan, and we furnished it exactly like the uh, house where the people died, and we walked people through there, and they said, yeah, that looks just, just like it, and then we lit it on fire. And <laughs> this was, this was a part of the test. And that fire burned, the couch was, was just like gasoline. And within three and a half minutes, the room was untenable, and within four minutes, flashover had occurred, and uh, my colleague and I, who had been working with the prosecutor, had estimated 15, 20 minutes minimum before that room flashes over. And after that test fire, I, I had to say to the prosecutor, I thought, I can't give the testimony that I had planned to give. And I was, I was set up for a deposition. Florida is one of the states with uh, depositions in criminal cases. Uh, I was thoroughly chastened by that experience and uh, began to try to be a little more conservative in my approach to fires. And Lynch, I'll ask you the, the same thing. Uh, what has been the most memorable uh, question document case for you? I'll give you one I had uh, testified in, uh, two years ago in, in, in L.A. Um, the attorney who retained me produced um, a will, and he said he thinks the signature on the will is forged. And um, I looked at the signature, and I had lots of specimens, and I told him, I'll clear that, no, that, that signature is a genuine signature. And he was shocked. I said, the only problem is it wasn't written in 2012. Oh, yeah. Because I, I had, uh, the gentleman was very ill, mm -hmm. and I had lots of signatures each month for about mm -hmm. two years before he died. Mm -hmm. And you can see how his signature was deteriorating. Mm -hmm. I could actually, based on its quality, say this actually was written maybe in 2010 mm -hmm. rather than 2012. 
So that was one part of the case. And the, the attorney was just still very shocked that it was <laughs> it was a genuine signature. Mm -hmm. But the, the party who, who produced the will, or who produced the explanation for the will, also produced a, a, a four-page printed will, which is unsigned. The will, the contents were the exact, almost the same thing as the uh, uh, the uh, signed will from 2008, which no one disputed, except for three lines that gave the gave the um, the guy's estate to the gardener. There were no erasures on this document, nothing. So my testimony was okay. It's either this was printed uh, from scratch, new new document, or the gentleman had a copy, a PDF copy of the of the will, went into Adobe Acrobat, say edit text and images, edit text and images, save and print, and you cannot tell. That is. Okay. Yeah, so I give the judge the options. So these are these are the options. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I can't tell which one is more likely. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite an interesting case. Yeah, I think my yeah. my side prevailed, okay. so this, which is good. <laughs> All right. And when, I, when I say my side, the side retained me. The one my, yeah. not my side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And uh, I think that we're up against the clock um, for for um, this seminar. And I just want to thank you for joining us for today's webinar. And please continue to check the spotlight section of our homepage on ncstl.org for information about upcoming seminars uh, and webinars. Um, all webinars are available on demand and can be found on the education and training page of our website. And those, uh, the materials that um, accompany those uh, webinars are also up there for you, the PowerPoint presentations along with the speaker uh, biographies and such. So please make sure to fill out your survey in your email and the survey will be emailed out to you and it will enable you to receive your CLE information. So on behalf of Stetson University College of Law, the National Clearinghouse and the Bureau of Justice Assistance, my guest speakers and myself and on behalf of um, the director, Carol Henderson, thank you for attending.